presented by extraction is not complete. Gaps include inadequate risk management plan, lack of proper drainage plan, fails to protect health, safety, and welfare. In addition, issues to, pre to be resolved by the city before approval, clarification on how all BMPs will be enforced, the emergency plan is not complete, the conditions for CD approval have not been met, and to assure the CDP represents constituents. This presentation is by no means all-inclusive. Please note that the current CDP is over 1,300 pages long, which is a cumbersome amount of information. Here we just point out highlights of areas where we have concerns. It is essential that those making decisions understand the ramifications based on the content of this massive document. Your constituents that you are about to hear from want to stress the CDP is not ready for approval because there are areas that extraction has not met, but also because there are still issues that need to be resolved by the city before this project can start. As a community, elected city representatives and residents, we should all be certain that there is no detail that is left unresolved before moving forward, regardless if that takes extra time. Okay. Yes, here we go. To introduce the inadequacies of the risk management plan, we must first understand the BMP requirements for risk assessment from the operator agreement. Item 55, Risk Assessment of the Best Management Practices in the Operator Agreement states, as part of operator's application to the city, operator agrees to provide a risk management plan which will include the identification of potential risks, methods of risk avoidance, and controls that implement techniques to prevent accidents and losses and reduce the impact or cost after the occurrence of identified potential events. Risk avoidance is the elimination of hazards, activities, and exposures. It is a risk treatment that avoids or discontinues the actions that trigger a particular risk. Extraction legitimized the risk matrix by including it in their CDP, but now disavows it, which leaves us with questions. What are the real risks? What's the likelihood of an occurrence? What are required mitigations? We need the identification of potential risks and method of risk avoidance to ensure protection of health, safety, and welfare. Extraction must identify risks to health, safety, welfare, and the environment, including regional issues. Thank you. Thank you very much for your patience for that. I'm sorry. That's right. Pat has a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, Mayor, um, City Council, staff. My name is Pat Talbot. I live in Anthem Ranch. I learned that the goal of engineering is to reduce risk. Ironically, though, by legitimizing bad data, the risk management plan exaggerates risk. I think the goal should be a cumulative mitigated risk. Those characteristics would be that that risk would be low and it would be credible. Risks are really costs. Costs can be inconveniences, physical damage, loss of life. Math combines costs and risks. Here's a quick example, transmission repair. Guy gets his automobile looked at. The counter person says, you know, the parts are $3,000. The labor and miscellaneous are $4,000. The customer says, wow, $7,000. The counter person says, well, no. That double counts some costs. The miscellaneous does. They weren't meant to be combined. Let me make you a deal because we use best management practices and we have a safety culture. The question is, how would they stay in business? And my message is, Let's define risk items without double counting. Let's make our life easy. We use math to combine probabilities. Uh, they provide understanding, credibility, and traceability. When we flip a coin, one flip is not interesting. We know it's a 50-50 chance. You flip it twice, now we say, what's the probability of one or more heads? 75%, that's more interesting. Cell phone availability. 1% less availability turns out to be 14.4 minutes a day that you might not get cell phone coverage. Small percentages can lead to large impacts. So combining risks, what we want to do is define them as independent. What started me off on this 20 months ago was I thought about 100 risks 
each with a one in a million chance. And by the way, every time I say risk, I mean independent risk. Now, for 100 wells in 30 years, that all adds up to 26% risk. One in a million chances. So, message, small individual risks, large cumulative risk. I put this together in November of 2016, and I still believe it is a solid basis for extraction to perform their risk assessment. This is what they showed to the Securities Exchange Commission. It turned out to be something like 26 pages. I summarized it here, and in red, I've identified the ones that should, be, in fact, be filtered out. Finally, the ask for extraction oil and gas. Complete that risk matrix. Make the risks independent. Look at probabilities of occurrence per well per year, and then tell us what the cumulative probability is for 30 years. Determine risks for each category. Repeat for mitigated risk. That's what we really care about. We need to care about the mitigated risk. And let's have some references and worksheets so we can trace the numbers. Thank you. Thank you. we got Charlie Lynn, David Nolan, and Bill Young. Mayor Ernst, Council Members, Charlie Lim, Wild Grass. Uh, I'm here to talk about the lack of proper drainage plan in the CDP. The operator agreement requires a drainage plan in the CDP, and Section 37 states that it must comply and conform with the city's stormwater control regulations. In a March 23, 2018 letter, the city informed extraction that its drainage plan was not in compliance. This non-compliance was still not addressed in the May 11th extraction CDP update. The city repeated its request for a correct drainage plan to extraction on May 24th. An extraction acknowledged the email but did not update the drainage plan in the CDP. Tammy stated at the June 12 council meeting that this drainage plan is still an unresolved issue. In the city engineer's May 24th email, it indicates that modifications to extraction's drainage plan in line with the city's specifications, quote, may result in some pretty significant changes, unquote. We want the city to resolve this issue in the most protective way possible, Therefore, the CDP should not be approved until XOG or extraction modifies its drainage plan to comply and conform with the city stormwater regulations. Please do not force the city staff and the city engineers to approve something they do not think are complete nor compliant. Thank you. Thank you. David Nolan, Bill Young, and Lori Anderson. Mayor, Council, thanks for having me again. Uh, Dr. David Nolan, I work with Kaiser Permanente over in Rock Creek. I live in the Broadlands, next to Guy Lane. <laughs> um, I'm, I was asked to speak tonight about, once again, the health and safety of what's not included in the comprehensive drilling plan, which is our long-term health. Um, I presented to you guys about uh, two months ago. Thank you for having me then. So you're familiar with the data. I don't want to repeat all that tonight, but ultimately it boils down to, as an expert member of the physicians uh, for social responsibility, I feel I need to be here. Um, we have McKenzie who has quoted a 4.3-fold increased risk of acute lymphocytic leukemia in folks living closest to fracking wells. That's most of Broomfield, <laughs> if this goes through. There are many large studies, which we went over last time, including increased risk for asthma exacerbations, uh, increased risk for low birth weight children. I feel like um, extraction, thanks to the CDPHE, thanks to CRGCC, has not been forced to answer these tough questions. Thank you, Mr. Krieger, um, for holding them accountable last week. Um, and thank you, Elizabeth, for meeting with me last week also to discuss this. It's really helpful. I do want to keep this in mind when we go forward. Um, I don't think that it should all be about the traffic flow, the air quality studies. I know CDPHE has had their hands uh, kind of strung because of this. Uh, PSR plans to address that in the coming months, um, both with Dr. Woke and with the CDPHE, hopefully with our new governor. 
Jared. It'll be even better. Um, sorry. No, I'm not allowed to say that. Um, so moving on from something that's a little bit outside of my league, but I was asked to speak about this. We do have to think about the toxic chemicals, the mines, the fact that a lot of Broomfield is built uh, next to or on old abandoned mines. What gases are down there? We don't know. Uh, somebody had addressed earlier on the fact that pockets are volatile, pockets of gas changes. Uh, we don't know if we hit the wrong pocket, what will happen? Will Windsor happen here? Uh, will we get an explosion next to a school? We know our setbacks are inadequate, woefully, thanks to our state. Um, we're working on that. <laughs> Hopefully we can prolong this long enough that that will be a factor in our decision as well. But I do feel like at this point CD, the CDP is not uh, adequate and they haven't been forced to answer these questions and we shouldn't allow them to bully us. Uh, better Business Bureau doesn't mean bribe, bully, and batter. we got to keep them accountable. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. We've got Paul Young, Laurie Anderson, and Becky McConnell. All right. Good evening, Mayor City Council. It's been a while. Um, so a year ago, actually, I sat here and I talked to you guys about extractions, past uh, spills, and incidents. And at the time, I had a slide, or I had a presentation that included 90, or 29 spills. That was over two years. On the screen now are the 35 in the past one year. So as we talk about health and safety and track record, we have to look at the actually increasing number of incidents that we're seeing from the provider coming into the, as they come into the state and as they come into the region. Um, another thing is, last week, as we talked through this, um, we, uh, or I'm sorry, two weeks ago, I guess, one of the things that you heard was that spills were not leaving the sites. That's simply not true. These are from extraction's own records. Uh, a gasket failure on a heater treater was identified as the cause of the release, causing a release or causing the releasing of five barrels of crude oil outside of the outside of the containment and off the site. A very thin mist was carried by an extreme wind a short distance into the adjacent agricultural fields to the south. We've got our water reservoir going in right next to this. Is that an agricultural field? No, but the same basic incident applies. And we heard from extraction two weeks ago that these were not leaving containment. 35 incidents that we look at it as we look at our history here. And then the other thing that we have to look at is the remediation and the remediation documentation. I want to read the first one here. Operating procedures are currently under review to identify controls that will mitigate the possibility for human errors in the future. That's what extraction wrote as their mitigating factors for how this incident wasn't going to occur in the future. And this incident was closed out and accepted uh, as done. Uh, so the, the resolution for this is that they're going, that the, the resolution is under review, but that's the end of it. This is an accepted and closed incident. There are 20 of these, all related to human error as the cause of the spill. 20 incidents that say, we're going to review our processes with operations. We're going to review and close and check our processes. Uh, we're going to make sure our processes are reviewed for thoroughness. Something's not working if this is how, uh, how the documentation is saying that improvement is going to happen. If all you have to do is say, yeah, we're going to do better next time by educating people, but we're not seeing any improvement, that's something that we have to hold them accountable for. And we have to ensure that there is process, that there's clear documentation, and that we understand the causes of each spill and each incident and the implications. And right now, that is not transparent today. The best we get are vague recommendations that we're going to educate people better and no signs of improvement. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Uh, Jason, uh, Lori. Becky, then Jason Anderson. Hi, my name is Laura Anderson from Anthem Highlands. Um, so we just heard about leaks and spills. That's completely independent from um, from fires and explosions and other accidents. So I looked at the COGCC website thinking I would find some kind of annual report of how many accidents, how many fires, explosions there are, they don't report that. You have to dig deep, and I'm under, in that process right now with the help of the COGCC, I am going to find that information. So for now, I am using a study called, Is Reporting Significant Damage Transparent Assessing Fire and Explosion Risks at Oil and Gas Operations in the United States? This um, project looked at 10 years worth of data from the COGCC website, and um, 
Actually, I'm skipping a slide here. So right, first, I have to start with defining the independent risks, defining the probabilities, and defining the cumulative probability. Um, and that goes back to page 16 of agenda item 11C, that accidents are not rare and must, must be strategically identified. So here's a study. So they looked at over a 10 year period, there were 116 unique fires or explosions in the state of Colorado. And it's interesting to note that um, residents living within one mile in the DJ basin, the average was 31, but the median was only three. That means for each of these incidents, it's 116 incidents, it's typically only three people living there. Broomfield, Livingston Pad, 1,745 households, not people. It's got to be 4,000 something for residents compared that to three or 31. Um, also, accidents may be underreported. Uh, in Utah, they have twice as many accidents reported. And if you look at Rule 602B, it's very specific as to what has to be reported. Not every accident or fire is reported to the CODCC. We have just a few examples of things that have happened recently. In Berthoud, October 31st, 2017, well near Berthoud starts spilling drilling mud 33 years after it was capped. Not very far away, maybe 3,000 feet away, extraction had just begun operations. Closest thing happening, they were 3,000 feet away. There was, no, there was no correlation. It was never finalized. There is no answer there. Here's Firestone, April 17, 2017, a fatal home explosion. Anadarko's statement was, no one may ever have all the answers. Windsor Fire and Explosion, December 22nd to 23rd, 2017. This fire raged all night. Um, cause remains unknown. And a darker oil tank, tank explosion in Mead, May 25th, 2017. One dead, three injured. The oil tank facility ignited as contract crews were doing maintenance. A few more coming, thank you. Thank you. We've got uh, Becky, Jason, and Jean Lim. I'm Becky McLeod, Ward 4. Um, <clears throat> so, let's see. Uh, this is the Hudson well blowout uh, that happened on January 2017. A well gushed for more than 24 hours, spraying at least 28,000 gallons of oil, gas, and drilling wastewater. This is a map of the Hudson well blowout. Uh, showing the mist where oil and gas and drilling wastewater reached as far as 2,400 feet from the wellhead. Um, this is an incident that happened up in Greeley uh, and forced evacuation of the football stadium on September 2017. Gas leak for, forced ex evacuation um, of the stadium in Greeley. This is um, Legacy Elementary School in Frederick. An incident happened on April 2014 where a storage tank exploded at approximately 1,800 feet away from an elementary school. Uh, this is a photo of venting near Aspen Ridge uh, School in Erie on September 2017. Um, there was leaking from uh, open top tanks 25 yards from the Erie School playground where VOCs were vis visibly drifting towards children on the playground. This is the Oklahoma explosion. Um, the cause was a safety valve fail failure, same as Deepwater Horizon. Staff could not remotely close down the well. Five lives were lost and cattle in the surrounding area also died. This is um, a lightning strike near Greeley, April 2015, where a wastewater storage tank exploded near the airport. And this is a really recent uh, uh, thing that happened last week in Hudson, where lightning uh, striked about six tanks. And on June 7 or June 12th of 2018, Eric Jacobson stated that to best of, the best of his knowledge, there was only one lightning-induced oil and gas incident 
in Colorado this century. And four days later, we had this. Thank you. Thank you. So we got Jason Anderson and Jean and Jennifer Dulles. Good evening, Council. Jason Anderson, Anthem Highlands. And I'm here to talk about lightning. Once in a lifetime, once in a century events. And not because I'm a big Tesla fan, both the physicist and the rock band, but I've got some data <laughs> here. The last 10 years, and, and this is this is not my data, it's not environmentalist data, it's not activist data, this is from the COGCC. This is data from the COGCC. 10-year period, 16 lightning strikes reported as the cause of fire explosion. And, you know, over the active wells that were in place during that time, um, you, if you apply that to the 84 wells that are proposed over a 30-year period, that's a 9% chance of a lightning strike in a well causing a fire. I think I'll play the lottery before I, I, I bet on that one. Uh, furthermore, the COG, more data from the COGCC. 49 fires and explosions. A report uh, unclear and unknown cause. And you apply that rate to the, the, to the planned project, 84 wells, for a 30-year period, that's a 25% chance. Again, this isn't my data. These aren't my calculations. These are, this is data from the COGCC. And finally... 116 unique fires or explosions identified at oil and gas sites from the COGCC database. This is a 49.5% chance of a fire over the 30-year lifetime of the wells that are proposed. So it, it doesn't seem like operating accidents are rare. Um, and the MOU clearly calls out it's the operators required to identify independent risks, determine methods of risk avoidance. These are the things that they're expected to do in the C CDP. This includes fires and explosions. So I, I, I'd ask you, do you think the technology is proven? Have the risks been eliminated? And is this plan even enforceable? Because, I mean, I mean, frankly, once the CDP is approved, there's a shift in risk. There's a shift in risk to the third party. And if Broomfield approves the CDP, um, but I'm not here to tell you what I think, what I think you should do. I'm here because I want to hear as a council what you think. What do you think Winfield should do? If the risk, do you think the risks are acceptable? Do you think the risks are unacceptable? Do you think the calculations are wrong? But if they're wrong, what do you think we should do? I'm not, a, I'm not an attorney. I'm not a petroleum engineer. I'm not a lobbyist. I'm not a politician. That's for sure. Um, but I'm, I'm a father. I'm a dad. My husband, and I'm here because I want to hear what you think Broomfield should do. I respect your opinion, and that's why I'm here. Thank you. We've got Jean, Jennifer, then Candace Spicer. Oh, thank you. My name is Jean Lim. I live in Wildgrass. Um, in the first section of our presentation, we tried to point out um, particular items in the CDP itself that we thought extraction needed to address before the CDP was approved. In this section, we want to discuss issues that we feel need to be resolved by the city be itself before approval. So first of all, we think that we need clarification on how, how all of the BMPs will be enforced. And we all appreciated the efforts of staff and citizens to secure many best management practices in the operator agreement. However, due to COGC decisions, the citizens have no assurances at this point that the BMPs will be enforced. The COGCC had encouraged local governments to enter into operator agreements so that many issues are resolved before the permits ever re reach the COGCC. However, it was obvious to everyone from Broomfield who attended the October COGCC Extraction Spacing Unit Application Hearings that the COGCC had absolutely no idea how to deal with the contingencies set forth in the City's Operator Agreement with Extraction. After extensive discussion among the Commissioners in the, at the October hearings, the COGCC added language that the Form 2 and 2A PAD permits must, quote, comport with, unquote, the Operator Agreement. In the city's communications with the COGCC, 
The city stated that it pushed for all of the, of the BMPs to be attached to the Form 2 and 2A permits. However, in the COGCC's June 1st approval of the Livingston PED permits, the COGCC stated that it only included the BMPs it thought enforceable and within its jurisdiction. The remaining BMPs that were so carefully included in the operator agreement by the city were stripped from the permits. At the June 11th COGCC hearing that several of us attended, Director Murphy pointed to, quote, the city's authority to legally enforce the rest of the BMPs that were not attached to the permits, end quote. Citizens on June the 12th requested a BMP gap analysis from the city to better understand what is, C what is COGCC willing to enforce and what the city is responsible for enforcing. Are the city's powers limited to contract law? If the COGCC lacks jurisdiction and authorities in these areas, does the city have authority beyond contract law? Specifically, how will this dual jurisdiction work? We believe BMP enforcement is a crucial yet incomplete piece that must be addressed before CDP approval. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Medner. All right, to follow on to Jean's comments, and again, Jennifer Douglas, it's good to see you all again, and thank you again for taking time to listen to this. I want to appreciate and, and respect your time. I also want to tell you it took us a heck of a lot longer to put the presentation together than it's going to take for you to listen to it this evening. So <laughs> thank you. Um, as we talk about enforcement mechanisms, which Jean was speaking to, uh, it's, it's important in our mind all requirements of the operator agreement and the CDP must have specific criteria that can and will be enforced. We request the city step us through this process. Extraction's response to citizen comments in the past, many of our concerns have not been addressed, and transference of the response to the city does not address the concern. As a quick case study, the Coyote Pad and COGCC complaints. The Coyote Pad, as many of you know, has caused significant issues for nearby residents. We compiled a collection of comments from the COGCC, from various Facebook posts, and also from, for, again, formal complaints about this pad. So just a quick sampling, I mean, we couldn't grab everything. Complaints, complaints, complaints. I'm just going to read some that were formally filed um, with the uh, folks at the COGCC. Just a small snippet. snippet. Noise vibrations. I woke up at 5 a.m. this morning to vibrations again. Looking out my window, there's a new drill and three new pumps. Could someone please pretend to care? I've had my house on the market for 43 days. No one wants to buy it. I cannot continue to live like this. Not only do you not care, but you know that you are hurting people. Is there no integrity or caring about people? Next one. A strong, thick petroleum smell is around surrounding the air around my home by our mailboxes and on the community trails. It's another workout ruined, another outdoor opportunity for my kids to play that's been ruined on a beautiful spring evening. Both my children complained immediately while playing outside, saying it makes them feel sick. Odor detected in my backyard. My backyard faces west. There's an acrid, like burning wood with solvent type chemicals smell. The odor was very strong at 9.35 p.m. Again, it's acrid, something between wet wood and solvent-type chemicals. So these are residents who are logging complaints to the COGCC continuously, time and time again, and absolutely nothing is happening. And so our question to you is, what can we do about enforcement if a similar situation happens? This is excessive noise, odors, and even shaking of homes. So we want to look closely at enforcement mechanisms. Thank you. Thank you, Candace, Mark Goodner, and then Lewis Vindicoy. Hello, Council. I'm Candace Spicer of the Anthem Neighborhood. Um, I am going to highlight this evening 
the evacuation plans that are not yet complete. Uh, citizens need to be aware of the risks with having several wells in close proximity, as well as health risks that are involved with an emergency situation. Complicated and expensive procedures and infrastructure are needed. Will the operator be providing upfront funds to support emergency personnel and procedures, traffic evaluations, air quality monitoring, etc.? Is the city planning to keep the communities up to date on their tiered evacuation and alerts? How will citizens be alerted of an emergency and what precautions are necessary to take? How will we be notified of a, if a procedure changes, of a shelter, if a shelter in place changes to an evacuation order, and are there identified safe zones? To date, the community has to have has had to request this information, this information has not been openly provided. If these details are not yet clearly outlined to the safety and security of the citizens, we are not yet at a point to approve a thorough and comprehensive drilling plan. School evacuations. There are playgrounds and schools less than a mile from the proposed sites. The coordination and planning of a nearby oil and gas related emergency is not detailed enough and not yet complete for the approval of the CBP. Gary Krieger, Chief of Police, recently stated, our planning will be complete by the start of the school year and before drilling commences. This tells me that if the safety analysis for our schools and our children is not yet clearly outlined, we are not yet at a point of approval for the CDP. What is the timeline for the operator and the staff to notify of an emergency situation? Who will be making an immediate decision as to whether students, teachers, parents will be sheltered in place or evacuated? Have the police, school, or operator identified safe zones where parents can reunite with their children if evacuated? Schools lack funding. They will undoubtedly lack funding for additional expenses such as planning drills, shelter in place, and evacuations. Would this be a city cost or at the cost of the well operator causing the emergency? Will there be any sort of bonding or insurance in place beforehand? Will parents be expected to drive through an evacuation zone to get their children? How will all kids be released if they are to be evacuated? Buses add costs and are not readily available. Both nearby schools do not have fully equipped busing. We are told that buses would need to be sequestered from Thornton. How quickly could they be available and arrive if coming from Thornton? HVAC and shelter systems to limit or eliminate toxins. What is the risk of exposure to these chemicals during an, an emergency? What are the side effects, long-term and short-term? How will parents be informed of these risks? Is there proper HVAC in place at the schools to limit or eliminate exposure to these toxins if there is an incident and need to shelter in place? How close will proper hazmat materials, supplies, and foam trucks be, and who makes the calls to whether or not those are used? What if use of fire retardant foam at the Livingston pad runs off and contaminates the adjacent Broomfield drinking reservoir? Thank you, and Kristen Logan after that, and then the queue. Good evening, Mayor Ahrens, Council Members, and staff. My name is Mark Lindner. I'm a wild grass resident here in Broomfield. And I'm going to briefly talk about some key aspects of the operating agreement as it relates to the approval process and some timing issues that goes along with that. Um, under the operating agreement in paragraph 9, uh, extraction is required to get approval from the city council. And then further in the operating agreement in paragraph 12, um, the operator is not only uh, required to comply with all the terms and conditions in the operator agreement itself, but also uh, chapter 17 dash before the municipal code. And if you dig into the municipal code on section 200, subsection 7, um, that section confers to the city manager discretionary power to delegate the approval or denial decision uh, to the city council. Um, The Broomfield um, residents are very concerned and interested in this topic, and uh, you know we don't get to make the decision. But the city council is the entity that most closely represents the residents' interests, so it would be appropriate uh, for the city manager to uh, exercise that discretionary power and delegate the uh, ability 
to uh, approve or deny this application. Um, however, they're getting to the approval process um, is premature. Uh, there are two hearings related to the locations of two of the pads, and I'm sure you're aware of that. So um, I want to highlight uh, in the operating agreement in Section 4, uh, so the, Section 4 requires that the locations of the pads adhere to Exhibit A, which is also part of the operator agreement. And um, we don't know where the, these pads are going to end up being located and if they are outside of the scope defined in Exhibit A, um, that breaches the operating agreement. And furthermore, um, the vicinity to Adams County could create some interjurisdictional issues that could affect this process downstream. Um, so it's, it's premature to, to make a decision until those matters are resolved. Thank you. Rose Marie Anderson. Um, good evening. Lois Vanderkoy for smiling. Some of us have been having a dialogue about bullying, and I will um, try to enhance that dialogue by talking about trust. Speaking for community members, and perhaps some of you, this is the perception. The industry very much wants to access their property or minerals to make money. They assert their entitlements by charming, making donations, grand promises, and generally trying to minimize the perception of risk to the community. Then when more is asked of them, they spend a lot of money on lobbying and supporting politicians who fight against more stringent standards. They spent a half a million against 301, and now millions to promote constitutional amendments to protect their property light rights. And this process leads to um, lack of good faith bargaining, dishonesty, inconsistency, misrepresentation, lack of transparency, using proprietary information to not share data, data anger, externalizing of blame, threats, slander, calling us liars, extremists, dividers, and sloppiness. The CDP was written in a way that was not clear, organized, and to the point. More specifics. Plan 24 wells, then propose 141. Withheld meaningful information when requested, like two weeks ago when they were questioned. Possibly breached the MOU within a few months after signing and resisted, in general, working with us to reduce size of operations and move them away from residences and the future reservoir. Significantly, they also threaten the council and city with lawsuits, core requests, trying to, um, you know, make people look bad and in collusion when really, um, Council members are just trying to let us exercise our First Amendment rights, freedom of press, right to free speech, and also um, assembly. So what builds trust? First of all, it takes awareness and ownership of one's own motives, behaviors, and emotions. That leads to honesty vulnerability, and empathy for oneself, as well as empathy or concern for other people's well-being. Thank you. Thank you. Kristen? And Karen Speed after Rosemary. Hi. Kristen Logan, Anthem Highlands, um, and I'm pretty consistent. So I'm here tonight just to talk a little bit again 
um, about the language of the Colorado Oil and Gas Act, which states that oil and gas development must be consistent with the protection of public health, safety, and welfare. Again, I want to remind everyone that the Martinez ruling clarified this and also put forward a mandate that oil and gas development should only occur in a manner subject to the protection of health, safety, and welfare. And ballot measure 301 also put forth the concept that the protection of health, safety, and welfare must also be upheld on a local level. All three of these laws, state law, court law, local law, they're all stating the exact same thing. Oil and gas development should only occur if it meets the standards of protecting health and safety. By making a requirement um, that health and safety is permitted in here in Broomfield at permitting, is Broomfield really in conflict with any state law? Let's talk a little bit more about power, perceived power. Um, the industry holds power through money. Um, they have a lot of it. It gives them access to the political system. It also gives them the ability to fund lawsuits and to threaten lawsuits. Um, they also hold power through the concept of state preemption. And in a lot of ways, that has limited local government's authority over gas and development. But the people, we, the people, have power too. We have the power to elect representatives. Representatives who work on our behalf, who represent our views, who speak in the ways that we speak because this is a representative government and you are representing your constituents. We have the power to create new laws, which is a fundamental right that's granted to us in the Constitution. And the right of initiative is what put forward ballot measure 301. We set forth the standard that health and safety conditions need to happen in Broomfield before drilling can start. We also set forth a standard in 301 that this condition must be met before the city council can approve permits. So these are things that we, the citizens, have used our powers to put forward. We have elected you, and we have passed laws. We, the residents, support our council when they take all steps to ensure our health and safety is protected. We support you fully. We believe that the CDP put forward by extraction should not be approved by our city until extraction can demonstrate that this project meets the conditions of protecting health and safety. We also believe that the city should not approve the final CDP until the city itself is fully prepared to ensure the execution of a large-scale industrial operation will not adversely affect the residents living here in Broomfield. The onus is on the operator. The onus is on the city. Our city is accountable to us, the residents of Broomfield, and they're accountable to upholding 301. We ask that our health and safety be protected, not just for us here today, but also for the future generations to come. Thank you. Thank you. We got Rosemary, Karen, and Therese Gilbert. I'm Rosemary from Anthem Highlands. Um, my my generation has concerns that these wells have been here for a very long time. So how are they going to hold up over time? Um, will my generation end up facing issues? And will my children's generation also face those issues? Operators will come and go, and but will be left with their problems. These, will, these well casings will be for, here forever. Um, we should all be concerned for that re one reason, or many reasons. Um, then U.S. News and World Report ranked Broomfield the third healthiest city. Broomfield remains a ha haven for outdoor enthusiasts with dozens of parks, more than 250 walking and biking trails, and 7,000 acres of open space. We can keep our community healthy and safe. We need to keep a large-scale industrial activity away from our neighborhoods. We must not be afraid to do what is right to protect our community, our neighbors, our fr and our friends. Do not let fear of the unknown stand in your way. Together, we can keep Broomfield healthy and safe. This is who you represent. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Karen. 